Adelaide. So conversation groups um, is facilitated by our chaplain. So we have in-house chaplain um, at Oasis. And uh, yeah, if you need to talk to them about anything, student life um, or life in general, you can speak to, to our chaplains. Um, before you leave for today, uh, I got one in here. So this is a timetable of our activities throughout the week. Uh, we've got, um, yeah, uh, Flinders May. So Flinders May is one of those programs that we have for students as well. So it's a conversation group that's facilitated by uh, students like yourself. So you know you can share your experience. Um, we'd like to have uh, domestic and international students in that conversation group. So you know we can share experience of how is it like in Flinders University and in Adelaide in general. Um, yeah. Um, I'll take this moment to promote next week. We'll have a well-being week. Uh, uh, and um, Oasis will have a center stage. Uh, you might see that today. Uh, we had a big gratitude wall in the student hub. Have you noticed that on your way in? Yeah, so in the student hub, um, there is a big gratitude wall. That's just a start, but next week will be the actual activity, and it, it's a week long. Um, come and visit us, and we'll be there. We'll promote you our services, and there'll be prizes as well. Uh, so, yeah, come along. Um, yeah, I'll give you to the stage to Chris. Yeah, I, think, I, think, I think you've covered Oh, yes, one thing I need to tell you about is on every Thursday, does anyone not know about the community market? So I assume most of you do. Okay, that's good. Well, keep coming. <laughs> 11 to 1. And yeah, one big tip for wellbeing next, uh, wellbeing week next week. On Wednesday, we're going to have three little succulent plants that you can take home and look after and put in your house. And, and that's a nice thing, isn't it? Have a nice little succulent. But come and join us anytime. We've got free tea and coffee and look forward to seeing you around. And all the best for the presentation and your placement. recording started. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay, all right. Hi, everyone. Um, so the thing is behind me, which makes it a bit awkward, <laughs> but we'll just do quick introductions. So Kim over here from the wheel team has to leave at three o'clock, so we'll make sure that her bit gets done quite quickly. Um, so welcome, everyone. It's lovely to see a good turnout. I know almost all of your faces, which is probably a good indication that you're all MSW students. Are there any BSW students here? Okay. <laughs> Lucas. <laughs> um, so this is a combination of uh, the FUSWA team, the Work Integrated Learning team, and the Field Education Academic staff, who do the last semester we did this information session, and it was very popular. So um, the FUSWA team has initiated it again. Um, so we'll be taking you through basic uh, pre-placement inf information that's important for all of you to know as you prepare for your mainly first placement. I see people in the room are mainly going to be doing first placement next semester. So um, I'd like to acknowledge, of course, that oh, oh dear, <laughs> help, <laughs> that we meet on the land of the the beautiful land of the Ghana people. Um, and we pay respect to our elders past, present and emerging, emerging and we acknowledge that this is and always will be Aboriginal land that's not been ceded. Um, so let us reach out. <laughs> Thank you. I don't, know, I don't know why it doesn't want to work from here. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so we'll do some introductions, we'll talk about pre-placement um, information from the work integrated learning team's point of view, and then Kirsty and I will talk about the academic uh, field education aspects um, of the placement topics. Um, and then as Lucas said, we'll have an informal um, question and answer session afterwards. Um, reach up. <laughs> Um, so, first of all, the college who's who, um, the college work integrated learning team, Annelise and Kim, do you want to stand up so that everyone can see you in the camera? <laughs> <laughs> so, Kim Morris um, and Annelise Hogan um, are, to put it at the other end of the 
quote from Tasman's um, email address. Do you want to say anything more about yourselves? Just hello. Yeah, hi, I'm Kim, and I look forward to helping you all get out on, on placement in the upcoming semester. Mm. Thanks, Kim. And the team leader for the Wood Integrated Learning team is Rachel Hutchinson. She's just come back from maternity leave. Um, she couldn't be here today, um, but she is um, obviously an important part of the team as well. So that's the Wood Integrated Learning team from Tasman. Um, so field education academic staff members, we have topic coordinators, first of all. So the first placement bachelor's topic is Luke Roberts, who is going to pop in when he can. He's at another meeting today. Uh, final placement bachelor's topic. Uh, so that's probably... Lucas, have you you got there yet? Um, yes. So yes okay, right. So final placement bachelor's and the uh, honours um, students. Uh, your topic coordinator is Rebecca Stars, who's also the BSW course coordinator. Um, the SOAD 9107, which is the first placement master's topic, I normally coordinate that, but some next semester someone else is going to be doing it. Um, so we'll let you know as soon as possible who that's going to be. And then Kirsty is the final placement MSW uh, topic coordinator. Did you want to say? You're happy not to say more. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, so I'm currently the academic field education coordinator. My role is now being split into two. Um, we have an academic field education coordinator who's starting next week. Um, her name is Johanna. Hmm? And then we have Lorna Hallahan, who's the um, academic lead in field education. So she's taking over part of my role as well. Um, you probably... Those of you who've done so at 9102 with me will know Lorna from a guest lecture. Yeah? That's Lorna. Yeah. Um, oh, and then other staff in field education. There are lots of them because there are lots of you. So we have casual field education liaison staff and casual external field educators who work with some of you on placement. So the pre-placement overview. Uh, let's start with the bits and pieces that Kim and Annalise mainly deal with. So I can swap space. Thanks, Jenny. So we're a little way through the timeline already, so um, we might jump straight through to where we are now with the timeline, because most of you would have completed the first couple of steps. So uh, we have begun our matching process, and so that entails us using the student information required for placement that you've um, shared with us on InPlace um, in order to match you appropriately to a placement. Um, and we've now got the compliance um, open up for students to commence. So we'll move on to another slide shortly, which goes into a little more detail about compliance. Um, but just to note on this slide that our compulsory compliance is due on the 30th of June. Um, and as I said, matching has already kind of commenced. Once students are compliant for placement, that's when matching um, is released out to, to students. And that happens from, um, from following the 30th of June all the way through to the end of July. Um, so that really just depends on, on how we go matching students to, um, to agency. So there's no set date that all students will receive their placement notifications. That happens over a period of time. Um, sorry, just going back there, Rucha. Um, something else to note um, for students who have applied for a work-based placement in their workplace or in a workplace or interstate, those applications are due to um, due to the team by in place on the 15th of May. Um, and the 3rd of July, we've got that on there as well. That's the earliest that students can commence their um, placement. And that's because that's the date that the flow topic for placement opens up. So nothing earlier than that date. Thank you. So interstate, rural, remote, and work-based placements. Um, not sure if Janine, you or Kirsty want to jump in here about what. Um, 
so I'm the academic that's responsible for assessing the interstate placements. Um, so that's for any student that resides outside of South Australia. Um, and so you need to, um, generally students with an interstate placement need to locate their own placement opportunity um, and, and do some negotiation with the agency. You then need to submit a form so that the placement can be assessed to make sure that it meets certain requirements, like that you've got um, the right kind of learning opportunities um, so that we can find out about what supervision arrangements will be, those sorts of things. Um, and so I'm the person that then will look at them and make that decision. Um, so we need them in as soon as possible so that that process can take place. Um, and I think some students will be interstate and it's a work-based placement. In that case, um, it's, um, it will be assessed under the work-based placement um, academic who will then have a look at that to make sure that it's meeting the requirements um, that the AASW give us about what placements need to look like. And I don't know anything about the rural. I can no. speak to the rural. You can one speak to yeah. that. Um, so yes, you would have noticed on your student information for placement as well, there was a criteria there where you can put your hand up for a rural placement. So we have received a few of those. Um, there is an information sheet available on our flow site. Um, and there's also an application form that needs to be completed and uploaded to in place for rural interest. Um, and we will do our best to, um, to source a placement within that area, but it's, however, it's not always guaranteed. Um, yeah, so moving on to the next slide, work-based placements. Do you want to talk about the, re the requirements? Yeah, so, I mean, there, yeah. You can hang on, hang on to that. Okay. <laughs> I've got mine. Um, so, yeah, um, one of the important things is that first fill uh, form that uh, Kim and Annalise get you to fill in. It can be confusing if you haven't had an information session yet. So make sure that if you tick rural remote, that you know what that means. So it means that you're at least 80 kilometres outside of um, metropolitan Adelaide and wanting to do placement in a, a sort of country um, or remote or rural location like um, Port Piri, Wyala, Hoover Pedy, those sort of places. So just checking. <laughs> if you did tick rural remote, make sure that you did intend to tick it. And if you ticked it by mistake, just contact Kim and Annalise at um, SW Placements. Um, and then work-based placements, what that means is if you're currently working in a human services organisation um, in a particular role, it may be possible for you to do a placement there, but there are very strict requirements of the Australian Association of Social Workers, and we have to make sure that your um, placement is able to meet those requirements. So they also get assessed by one of the academics. Currently, that's Luke Roberts, who assesses the work-based placements. Um, so unfortunately, when students ask us, can you please give us a paid placement? No, we can't, because <laughs> um, there's no such thing as a paid placement. Um, the the, the work-based placements are for people who are already employed in a human services um, agency. Um, just see what the next one is. Future. Okay, do you want to talk about that, Kim? So you would all have had access by now to our student placement management system, which is in place. Um, you'll see the icon looks a little like that, and that is accessible from your, uh, your Okta dashboard. Um, so basically, that is the system that we use to match students to placements. We have all of our placements in that system, and we have all of our students in the system as well. Um, and like I said earlier, we use all the student um, information that you've provided to us to match students um, appropriately to placements. Because the placements, they have certain requirements um, and our students um, obviously have certain requirements as well. So we put the two together. Um, yeah, so that's in place basically. Um, thank you, Rita. And so moving on to um, compliance. So there is a set of compulsory compliance items that is required by all students before they can have a placement match released to them and also before they can go out on placement. So all compliance uh, is or should be uploaded to InPlace um, and that needs to be verified by myself or Annalise. 
Um, so it's important to check in place regularly to make sure that your compliance documents have been verified. Um, in some instances, they are rejected, but we do leave a comment um, as to why those uh, certificates um, haven't been approved. Um, so we've got a beautiful resource that's been uh, included in the emails that's gone out to students, which lists all of the compulsory compliance, compliance items, which is um, for South Australian students is the police check, it's the working with children check, and also the aged care sector screening check. So those compliance items need to be submitted by all students. If students are undertaking their placement interstate, they will then need to do their state-specific working with children check and also the um, state-based mandatory reporting check. Um, sorry, what I missed as well for uh, South Australian students that is compulsory is the safe environments through their hours training. So on the document that's been included on the emails and also is available on our flow site, it goes into more detail. There are links within that document on how to apply for these checks and also how to um, attend these um, training sessions. Um, it's worth mentioning that the DHS checks are initiated through us, through the Will Support Team, unless of course students have already got those documents and there's no need to undergo that process through the university, they can upload what they have. Um, something else that's worth mentioning about the police check it does need to have specific wording on the police check. It does need to state unsupervised contact with vulnerable groups. So quite often we get police checks that don't have this wording and unfortunately they um, are rejected. So again, refer to the document um, and the information on the web page and the flow site. It will detail for you how to go about obtaining that specific police check. Um, so that's all that's required by the 30th of June is the compulsory compliance items. Once students are matched to a placement and if there's any need for additional compliance, that will be included to the students in the email, the placement notification email, and it will then instruct them to go ahead and go and, uh, to do any additional um, compliance if, need, if needed. So just focus on the compulsory compliance at the moment and um, you'll be notified about anything additional if needed. Um, so preparing for interview, there uh, every student who is matched to an agency will have to go for an interview with the agency. Um, and we have lots of resources available on the flow site for students to begin preparing for that interview. Um, and so we do suggest that uh, students research the agency they've been matched to, come prepared with questions um, and use the resources available to them on our um, flow site. Um, do you want to add anything more about interviews or is that coming in a later slide for me? Maybe just a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah okay. You, I know you've got to finish. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I maybe... Let's see if there are any questions about, about the pre-placement yeah. stuff uh, for you and Anne Louise before you have to go. Sure. Any questions? Sure, okay, so the question is about the flu shot and whether that's mandatory. So that is not mandatory, um, that's an additional compliance um, item and that students, if students are matched to SA Health or Aged Care or any other agencies that require flu vaccination, when they're matched to that particular agency, they will then um, be asked to go and have the, the flu shot. Yeah, so it's not compulsory at this stage. Yeah. So for the DH checks, DHS checks, they are mandatory. So all students in, who are doing their placement in South Australia, they need to have a working with children check and they also need to have the aged care sector screening check. Yeah, and those two, we've already requested um, to, to DHS to have those checks undertaken for our students. So we initiate those two checks on behalf of the students.
the DH, how long until you get them. So we have requested those now to DHS for our students. And so hopefully within the next week or so, you'll get an email from DHS and you'll follow the steps in the email from them to continue the process. Yeah, that's a good question. So all compliance needs to be valid for the duration of your placement. So in this instance, I would say as long as it's valid through to the end of November, you should be good. Oh, so working with children check? Yeah, they are valid for five years. The aged care sector screening is valid for three years. Yes, yeah. Sorry, I can't and hear you. The safe environments training, eight hundred dollars. Oh, eighty dollars. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And could we add something to the safe environment certification? Richard, on the microphone. Otherwise, it won't. <laughs> they won't be able to hear you. Um, if you guys want to put in less money, what you can do is you can make a group of around minimum 20 people it was and book this very area in Oasis and have the uh, person come here, the trainer come here and train you. That's what we did because when you book a black, uh, block of 20 people, it costs much less because then you do group booking and you can book Oasis or um, I don't know, any other space in the university or somewhere outside as well. If you want... Booking... <laughs> <laughs> Bookings can be done through Woos, but we'll help you with that. If you need, just come and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, that is the police check that requires that wording on it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so vulnerable is now longer, no longer compulsory. However, it is worth mentioning that to apply for all three checks with DHS, it costs the same amount of money as applying for one or two. Yeah. Any further queries about pre-placement preparation? Talk about the yeah, yeah, but that would be anything once a student is on placement, it then becomes um, the FALS that you would contact, the field education liaison person, which Janine will speak to later. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so it's uh, generally four days a week, but that's coming on the latest slide that Janine will talk to. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else about compliance or interview preparation or in place? No? Okay. If not, you know where to find us on the SW placements email, um, and we'd be happy to assist. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, are you, you going to go with Kim now, or you want to stay for questions? I'll stay with Kim. Okay, okay yeah. sure. Okay. So just because um, I always talk too much, someone tell me when it's um, when I'm getting close to using up all my time. Okay. <laughs> so let's go to um, what is field education. So this is mainly, of course, for those of you going to be doing your first placement um, in. Uh, next semester. Um, we haven't actually had to do any placements yet. Um, so it is a core component of Australian social work uh, courses across the whole of Australia. There are also international requirements around field placement that we have to comply with and one of those is the thousand hours of field placement. So that's an international standard um, and I know that there's a lot of um, debate about that and we've certainly, some of us, been involved in trying to advocate for a reduction in hours because we know it costs a huge amount of money 
for students to spend a thousand hours on placement. Um, it, well, we think it's probably time, some of us think it's time for a, re a revision of that, but that's unfortunately an international standard that we at this stage um, have no control over, and if we don't comply with that, we're not internationally um, recognised. Um, so field placement is where you're learning in a workplace environment with real people um, in a range of kinds of uh, work that social workers can do. Um, the purpose is to develop um, effective and reflective practitioners um, who are integrating um, knowledge and skills into their practice in the human services setting, um, developing your confidence um, as well as your con competence. Um, and often in the beginning, people are really, really nervous and they need a bit of time just to you know, start developing your sense of um, uh, confidence in dealing with some of the things that, you, that you're exposed to in a field placement setting. Um, deepening understanding of issues um, related to values and ethics, so that's something that you'll be reflecting on throughout the course of your placement, um, and supporting the formation of professional identity, so understanding as part of your learning process what it means for you to be a social work student as opposed to a youth worker or a psychologist or a nurse or an occupational therapist and so on. Really trying to unpack what it is that social work is about and what that means in your practice as a um, social worker. Uh, Kirsty, feel free to jump in at any stage. Uh, <laughs> so essentially, thanks Rita, essentially Field education is knowledge transfer from the classroom to placement, um, plus the development of skills and the development of professional identity. Um, and these are all essential um, aspects of learning um, in field placement. Okay. So topic enrolment. So um, the enrolment process is a little bit different this time round. Um, the Will team um, have initiated the enrolment process. I don't know if there's anything you want to add there, Kim. Um, well, yeah, it's just coincided with our process basically this semester. Yeah. So um, enrolments were open for two weeks during the same period that the student information required for placement was open. Mm -hmm. So by now everybody should have enrolled in the topic. It's now closed, so there's no um, access to that yourself. If there are any enrolment issues, then they have to go directly to our enrolment and course advisors. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and the other thing is if you fail a prerequisite topic, um, you can't go into your placement because you have to pass all of those before you're eligible to do a placement. So those of you who are currently doing the first semester of the MSW, if you fail any one of those four topics, you would have to postpone your placement until a later semester. Similarly in the bachelor's program, I actually know a lot less about the bachelor's program because um, I don't uh, deal much um, with students in that space. Um, but before you do your first placement, there are also prerequisite topics that you have to complete, including theories of social work. Um, Susan, you might <laughs> remember some of the uh, prerequisite topics from your BSW, can you remember? Um, okay, yep. Okay, and so procedures and decision making and mental health. Okay, and then the theories of social work um, topic. Lucas, anything you want to add there? I have no to Okay. <laughs> Inter oh, that's right. Yes, the interpersonal skills topic. Yes, that you do in first semester in the bachelor's is a prerequisite topic. Sorry, I'm <laughs> not so clear on the bachelor's. Um, so. The, as I think we've already uh, mentioned, we have to comply with the accreditation requirements of the Australian Association of Social Workers, um, and those include a whole lot of things. Um, so, a thousand hours of placement is one of those requirements. Um, your two placements have to be in distinctly different learning contexts. So, we do sometimes have students who come to us after their first placement and say they loved it so much that they want to go there again <laughs> for their final placement. Unfortunately, that's not an option. You do have to do your um, final placement in a different area of practice to your first placement. Um, no placement can be less than 250 hours. So that doesn't mean that you can choose now to do a 250 hour placement. 
what it means is if you have a plasma termination for some reason, for example, health issues, that you may be eligible for credit for some of those hours, um, but if you have to do another placement, um, say for example, you've got 300 hours credit, technically you've only got 200 hours left, but you've got to do a minimum of 250 hours in a placement, that's again an ASW requirement. So, you know, if you do have a placement termination, you may end up doing a total of more hours um, than the 500 in one of your topics. Depends on your um, situation. Um, 500 hours of your placement time, so half of it, has to be in direct practice in some, um, in some way. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. At least one of your placements has to have an on-site qualified social work supervisor. So typically you'll have one placement with an on-site social worker and one placement with an external social work supervisor. So that's a really important thing to note because one of the things that happens is people go for an interview, they find out that the supervision in that particular placement is external and then they argue <laughs> with the agency about that. And so I can't go to a placement where there's external supervision. Yes, you can. Um, it is perfectly okay for you to be having your social work supervision externally. Um, but then in addition to that, you also have an on-site uh, supervisor who may have a different qualification, or they may be a social worker, but they're too busy to give you enough hours of supervision across the course of your placement. Um, so they'll be working alongside an external supervisor. So it's not a bad thing <laughs> if your placement um, requires an external supervisor. Um, active involvement um, in learning activities is important on placement. You can't just spend your 500 hours observing other people doing things. You have to have a go um, at things. But having said that, one of the things we find people get really anxious about, and I know Kirsty will <laughs> back this up is not expecting in the first week or two or three or even four to be getting right into practice. It's absolutely fine to spend the first few weeks observing people, you know, doing reading and preparation and that sort of thing before you actually do um, direct practice. So that's also something not to panic about um, if you're not, you know, getting right into it in your first weeks of placement. But if you've been on placement for several weeks and you're concerned about um, not having access to um, appropriate learning opportunities, then that is a, a good reason to contact your field education liaison person. So every one of you will be allocated to one of the academic field education liaison people who will work with you through the course of your placement and they're responsible for assessing your performance on placement. Um, thanks, Richa. Uh, so what is direct practice? So remember that requirement that says half of your placement hours need to be in direct practice. Very importantly, it doesn't have to include case management, working with individuals or counselling. can include any kind of direct work with real people, um, so service users um, of um, the agency that you're placed in. So it can include group work, community development, advocacy work uh, with service participants, uh, project work um, with service participants and so on. As long as you're working with people, it certainly doesn't have to include um, case work or case management or counselling. In fact, very few placements actually have counselling, very, very few. Um, that's just not how services are generally structured in our context. Uh, Richa? Um, placement supervision requirements. The most important thing for you to know is that there are minimum requirements around supervision. So in total, you have to have 21 and a half hours of social work supervision across the course of your placement, which typically is about an hour and a half a week um, of um, social work supervision. Um, if you have an external supervisor, they're very familiar with that. They, you know, they're very good about tracking their hours and making sure that they're giving you enough supervision hours. Sometimes social work supervisors who are on site need a bit of reminding <laughs> about um, needing to give you regular supervision. If you are struggling to get supervision hours, 
with your on-site social work supervisor. Again, that's something to contact your field education liaison person about, um, you know, confidentially, because um, we, can, we can help you to resolve that without you getting into an argument, you know, with, um, with anyone in the agency, because you want to avoid that. Um, uh, so if you have group supervision with other students, that's okay, but a maximum of 50% of group supervision is allowed across the course of your placement. So in other words, you do have to have some individual um, supervision. Okay. Yeah. Just to point mm -hmm. the individual supervision also has to be kind of quarantine time mm -hmm. that's with you, with your supervisor. It's not just the um, supervision on the run when you're yeah. you know, running between one client and the next. It has to be mm -hmm. time that you've actually put aside to have that supervision as well. So you can have a mix of both group and individual, but then the individual needs to be that sort of more planned supervision, not going mm -hmm. once on the run. Yeah, thanks, Kirsty. Okay. Um, so recognition of prior learning. Um, so just for you to consider whether you may be eligible for recognition of prior learning. So that means that you get credit for your first placement. So so at 3102 or so at 9107. Um, they are very stringent ASW requirements regarding uh, recognition of prior learning. Um, so you have to have a minimum of three, uh, three years of full-time equivalent experience in a relevant um, setting. So it can be multiple roles, but it's got to add up to a minimum of three years, full-time equivalent. Um, and uh, you have to be able to demonstrate that each of the roles that you've undertaken are at least equivalent to what a social work student would do in a first placement. And you have to have a social worker who can give you a reference um, to say that what you've done um, in your work experience is um, um, relevant um, and that they can back up what you've claimed in your rec recognition of prior learning report, um, application, sorry. There are two stages in uh, recognition of prior learning um, application and you submit those through Ask Flinders. Um, you can apply for RPL at any time of the year, but if you're wanting to have RPL considered for second semester, it's too late um, to submit stage one. Stage two is okay, but stage one, it would be too late to start the process now. So that means if you think you might be eligible for recognition of prior learning, it's better to change your study plan and postpone your first placement until first semester next year to give yourself enough time to go through the process of applying for RPL. Make sense? Okay, so that's probably not relevant to most of you, um, but I know that there would be some people for whom it is. The RPL applications are assessed by field education academic staff. Um, if you do get RPL for your first placement, it means you only have to do one placement, and that placement has to have direct practice and has to be supervised by an on-site social worker. Thank you, Richa. Access plan. So if you have a disability or medical condition or caring responsibilities, um, you may be eligible for a university access plan, which you can organise by contacting um, the um, counselling service. Um, and I've put a link in the slide there, and we will put the slide on the Work Integrated Learning Flow site for you. Um, this, this is really important because if you do have um, a disability or medical condition, we need to look at what adjustments you need on placement to ensure that um, you are properly accommodated and your needs are being um, taken into account. It is a confidential process. However, there's certain things that, of course, you're going to have to disclose to the agency so for ex or to the wheel team. So, for example, if you have a visual disability and you can't, um, uh, what? <laughs> what? An example. Um, Drive. <laughs> yes. We, Kim and we need to know that so that Kim and Annalise don't match you to a placement that requires that you drive an agency vehicle. Um, or if you have a, uh, if you're in a wheelchair and you can't go upstairs. So we did a, a couple of years ago have a student who was matched to an agency that only had stairs going up two flights um, 
and the student was very happy about the placement but couldn't actually access um, the service because of the stairs. Um, so you email your access plan to your topic coordinator. They will then have a confidential discussion with you regarding your access needs um, and those will be communicated to the wheel team just in terms of what specific adjustments you need. We, we don't need to know the reason why you have an access plan. The access plan doesn't say why you have it. Um, that's confidential between you and the disability service advisor. You can choose to disclose, of course, um, if you want to, but it's not up to us um, to disclose. Um, so that's access plans, feature. Okay, so where are students placed? Um, Field placements occur in a wide variety of geographic locations all over Adelaide and then also, also in rural remote South Australia and interstate. So when we talk about all over Adelaide, it's literally all over Adelaide, from Gawler to Murray Bridge to Victor Harbour. Um, the wheel team certainly does do their absolute best to match students according to geographic locations. Um, but I, it's important for you to understand that when there are 400 of you going on placement in the same semester, and if you look at the geography at, of Adelaide, Adelaide is kind of laid out in a long, um, you know, design because of the sea on the one side and the hills on the other side. Um, if for, and it's, not, it's never as simple as this, but if, for example, you've got a student who lives at Bedford Park and you've got a student who lives at... Uh, Kensington, and you've, the only placement option for those two students is at Elizabeth in the north. You're going to take the student who lives at Kensington and send them there rather than the student who lives at Bedford Park, even though, um, you know, for the student at Kensington it's not necessarily close, but it's closer than it is for the, for the student who's at Bedford Park, if that makes sense. So they're juggling, they're doing this amazing juggling act <laughs> around geography, which is really tricky. Just something I thought would be um, good to mention, Janine, that I didn't beforehand, is if you are doing your placement in um, South Australia, that is our responsibility to source a placement for oh, you. Yes. Yeah, we ask students um, not to source their own placements unless, of course, it's interstate or a work-based. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Kim. Yeah, good, good reminder. Because, and that's happened over several years. Um, uh, because of requests from agencies, because agencies, there are two social work programs in Adelaide, and agencies were, were becoming more and more inundated by students trying to organise placements with them directly. Um, they got tired of that, and so um, now placements are negotiated directly with the university for both UniSA and Flinders, so you can't organise your own placement. That's a really, really important um, message if you're in Adelaide. Um, Field placements are hosted by a range of organisations in a range of fields of practice. Um, so it's government and non-government organisations, a range of different kinds of services. Um, some agencies only host final placement students. So it's important to know, you know, if you've got your heart set on, for example, correctional services, they never take first placement students ever. In the 17 years I've been here, they've never <laughs> agreed to take a first placement student. And Kim and Annalise can't do anything about that. Um, and there are some agencies that, that will only consider final placement students, which means that there are certain kinds of placements that are more <coughs> common uh, for first placement students. Um, and there's, there is still a whole range, so from domestic violence to homelessness to schools to aged care to disability services to health services. There's still a wide range but there are certain agencies that are not possible for your first placement. Um, when you get to your final placement, you have more of a say in terms of areas of interest. Um, so the first, for your first placement, I would strongly recommend that you have an open <laughs> mind regarding where you go on placement. Um, and we've seen so many examples over the years of people you know, being matched to a particular placement, coming back and complaining and saying, I don't want to go there, and then they go there and they love it. Um, <laughs> of course, sometimes that doesn't happen, but sometimes it does, because you don't know what it's going to be like to be in a particular field of practice until you're in it. Um, so have an open mind. Wherever you go on placement can be a good learning opportunity. 
uh, the learning opportunity is what you make it. Um, and then once you've had that experience, when you get your, your final placement, it's easier for Annalise and Kim to be able to match you to one of your areas of interest because they have more options for final placement than they have for first placement, if that makes sense. And I say all of this because I've done placement matching before and I know <laughs> how freaking hard it is uh, when you're trying to, you know, trying to please 400 people, it's really hard. Um, formal partnerships, so Flinders University does have formal partnerships with several agencies that offers a minimum of 12 placements per semester. So you might be on placement with a whole bunch of other students in the same agency. And I've listed there the agencies we have formal partnerships with. I'm not going to um, go through them. Um, many of the other agencies that are not formal partnerships still take uh, more than uh, one student. So you might be there with another student, which is always lovely. Um, typically, people prefer not to be on their own. But some of you um, will end up being on your own just because of the nature of the placement that you've been um, matched to. Am I going for time? Is it time? Okay. Oh, there's a clock. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm, I'm probably just rushing. Anybody want to ask any questions at this stage? Or do you want to see whether your question's answered a little bit further on? Okay, let's keep going. So, placement attendance and timelines. Um, so, Flinders students are expected to undertake placement four days per week. That's typically what you do. If you're in the master's program, you're on placement Monday to Thursday and you attend classes on a Friday. If you're a bachelor's student, you do placement from Tuesday to Friday and you're in class on a Monday. Um, most placements are seven to seven and a half hours per day, most agencies. Um, takes about 17 to 18 weeks to do a placement if you're doing four days per week. Um, and that could be longer, depending on number of public holidays, class intensives, and sick leave. So if you're doing a placement in second semester and you're doing four days per week, you can expect to finish in about late November, early December. So just be aware that the 500 hours takes longer than a semester to complete and you do have to attend placement continuously uh, for the period of the 500 hours. Of course, if you get sick, you can take sick leave, um, or if you have a class intensive, you can tell the agency about that, just give them plenty of warning so that they know that you can't be there for that um, period. Um, in exceptional circumstances, you can apply to do a placement less than four days per week. Um, Three days a week is still relatively easy because most agencies can accommodate that. Two days a week is much harder to accommodate because there are very few agencies that can do that. But if you have an access plan um, that needs you to attend placements um, for fewer hours per week, we will always um, find a way to accommodate that. It just means that there's some placements that we wouldn't be able to consider in your particular case if you have an access plan. So the absolute minimum attendance required by the AASW is two uh, days or 14 hours per week. Um, and like I say, that's only if you have an access plan. Just be, uh, bear in mind as well, if you're doing three days per week, it's going to take you longer to finish. You're more likely to finish then late December, early, early January or even later January, depending on um, whether you had any class intensive or sick leave or public holidays and so on. Um, okay. Uh, the impact of COVID on uh, placements. So this, this is much less of an issue than it was in 2020, which was pretty hair-raising in terms of placements. Our poor students had a very, very rough time with placements in 2020 because there were so many agency shutdowns um, because of COVID. Um, all placement agencies now do have their own COVID management um, plan. Um, some of which have additional compliance um, requirements. Um, so, for example, in residential aged care, like we mentioned earlier, you will be required to have a flu vaccination. Um, if there is a COVID outbreak at your particular agency, in some cases they will temporarily shut the, the agency down, and that's only when they have really, really vulnerable people. So, in residential disability 
services, residential aged care, and some health settings. They may temporarily not allow you to attend um, the placement. If that happens to you, we do have mechanisms in place in the ac academic um, SAR to allow you to do um, relevant work from home so that it doesn't disrupt your placement too much. Um, and we've kind of fine-tuned this over the last couple of years so that it works a lot better than it did in 2020. So don't worry too much about that. We have a plan B if you are in an agency where you have to have a, um, a temporary um, shutdown. And it doesn't happen at many agencies anymore. And some agencies are still required to have... Oh, yes. Yeah. Aged care, yeah. Not all the time in aged care, but, but certainly um, some of the time you may be required to wear a mask. Um, Field education topic assessment. So just going back to that earlier question that came up while Kim was here, once you're on placement, your primary contact is with the academic staff. So in the first instance, your field education liaison person, and then if you're stuck there, um, you can certainly contact the relevant topic coordinator. You know, if there's anything that you want to, um, uh, that's more challenging or, um, you know, if you have a placement, uh, if any difficulties on placement, the topic coordinator would be involved in the conversation as well. Um, the way that field education topics are assessed, um, so first of all, it's a non-graded topic, so you don't get a grade like you do in your, uh, your prerequisite topics. You just, it's either pass or fail. Um, 500 hours of placement attendance is just part of the requirement. So it's really important to remember that this is an academic topic that has academic requirements attached to it. To it. And those include written assessments, they include um, uh, participation in integration seminars, which might be online or on campus. Um, there are particular uh, assignments that you need to do. Uh, you have a mid and an end of placement assessment where you need to pr provide evidence um, of your learning in relation to each of the learning outcomes. Um, and we guide you through that process. So we have um, all kinds of um, ways of giving you information and guidance around what those requirements are. Um, and also important to know at, this, at the moment, we have eight practice standards in field education. And in order to pass a field education topic, you have to achieve the minimum requirement in each of those eight learning, uh, sorry, practice standards. Um, and we, you will get further information about the assessment from the statement of assessment methods and the topic information booklet once you start the topic. All the field education topics go live on the 3rd of July. Um, the earliest possible start date for placement is the 3rd of July, but most of you will start mid to late July, depending on where you get placed. Can I have a one-year Oh, thank you, yes. Yeah. You know about Canvas? Yeah. <laughs> we all... <laughs> it's the new um, learning management system that we all have to get our heads around and we have to transfer our topics to for next semester. And we don't, we don't have time for this. <laughs> so we all groaning about it as well. Um, so yes, those of you who are now familiar with Flow and have finally got your heads around Flow, sorry, from next semester, you have to get your heads around Canvas, which is a different um, system. So this will be a new system that we Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so I feel like I've forgotten something. What have I forgotten, Kirsty? Anything that you can think of that I've forgotten or that you would like to ask? Yes. Uh, next year for the school year. Right. No, they know. Yeah. So each um, agency that provides placements. Even if, so if they're a new agency that's never had students before, we uh, talk to them about the requirements, we meet with them, 
um, we um, make sure that they can meet the, the requirements that you have around learning um, and also discuss the supervision um, requirements. So they should know, but sometimes when people are busy, um, they need a bit of gentle <laughs> reminding to pay attention to you. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Risha. So the question is, if you couldn't hear on the recording, um, if, you, if you find out who your field education liaison person is, you'll fail, um, and they haven't contacted you yet, you can certainly go ahead and contact them. Um, usually the field education liaison person sends an email to all of their students and the student supervisors, introducing themselves, providing documents, um, and also negotiating a date for an early placement meeting. So all of you will have an early placement meeting where your field education liaison person meets with you and your supervisors um, and they just discuss things like, you know, what are your learning um, activities, making sure everything's on track, um, making sure that relevant agency policies um, everyone's aware of, um, setting dates um, for the mid-placement assessment, um, talking about practicalities, that kind of thing. Yes. Okay, so an on-site supervisor can either be a qualified social worker or not. If they're not a qualified social worker, then you also have an external supervisor who is a qualified social worker. So you might have two supervisors, one external social work supervisor, and one on-site supervisor who's a different human services professional. So they might be um, an occupational therapist or a school counsellor or a wellbeing consultant um, or a youth worker. Um, sorry? Yes, yeah. <laughs> so a whole range. No. That, yes, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so you may not be working alongside a social worker, but you'll be getting supervision um, from a qualified social worker. Yeah? Yes. That question's come up a lot over the years. It's, uh, the, the question is about covering the cost of the safe environments training. And we've actually been asking for years whether there's a way of getting um, the cost of that funded so that it's not a cost to students. Because I, I, I think it's a really valid question. Um, there are a lot of expenses associated with field placement. Travel. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So at this stage, there aren't any, um, there isn't um, funding to cover those costs, unfortunately. And it's even worse for the students who, who do placements with SR Health because they have to pay for a whole lot of vaccinations, which can cost $400 um, um, for some of them, yeah. So yeah, it, it is a frustration, um, and we wish that there was, um, you know, better funding of the costs of um, field placement. And that's one of the reasons why there are a lot of uh, social work educators who are advocating for changes to those international requirements because the longer the placement requirements are, the more they cost um, students. And we've just got to the point in terms of the way the world works that it's very, very difficult for people to spend 500 hours at a time um, in a placement where they can't really earn an income, um, you know, meaningfully um, during that time. They've got to keep their life on hold, um, you know, in a whole range of areas. So it's, it is a real, it's very onerous the field education requirements. Um, yes. Um, so I think Richa might know a bit about this as well, but each year, FUSA have something called a development grant in which you can apply to have for a reimbursement of when you undertake those activities. So students who do first aid training, they might do their training and then submit that um, to FUSA for the development grant who then can reimburse up to 80% of that training. 
Um, so that happens each year. So that would be something to consider to help uh, to cover the cost of any of those sort of additional activities that you need to do to meet the requirements. Thanks, Annalise. Yeah, so you all know about FUSA, the Flinders University Student Association. So you get, um, if you go on the website, you can get further information about their um, services. Other. Out to? <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. yeah. So there is also, if you don't know, there is also a scholarship program for rural and remote uh, placements. So up to $3,000 of the expenses associated with a rural remote placement can be covered um, if you apply for one of those um, scholarships, if, but that's only if you're in a rural remote location. Any other questions? To the topic, so at 9107. So it wouldn't let you enroll in that? Oh, no, it placement's part of the topic. So as long as you're enrolled in so at 9107, yeah. Antoinette? Yeah. Yes, then um, you you covered it, placement is part of that, yeah. And integration seminars are part of that as well. Yeah. Um, anything else? Yes. That's a great question. If you fail the first interview at the agency, so, and this does happen, especially for first placement, um, so if you're unsuccessful at your first interview, so don't, first of all, don't see it as a fail. Um, it's important to reflect on why that might have happened. Um, and I think the first step is, hopefully you would have already looked at all the resources about preparing for an interview, but if you haven't, um, go back and have a look at those resources because they really are very detailed resources about preparing for an interview and the kinds of things that you should avoid saying and avoid doing, you know, to increase the likelihood of um, you being successful in an interview. Um, and uh, there are a couple of videos as well on the Work Integrated Learning Flow site um, that give you guidelines for placement interviews, including guidelines that come from agency um, staff members who've been interviewing students for several years. So they give you tips. So as a general guideline, when you're going for a placement interview, um, and we, we do cover this in more detail. Where do we cover this? I can't remember. <laughs> uh, I don't think, I think it's all on the website actually. Yeah, on the Work Integrated Learning website. Um, but the most important things are arrive on time, present yourself, you know, professionally. You know, we've had, especially domestic male students. Sorry, Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're an exception to this. But who go to interviews in flip-flops, shorts, um, you know, very, just way, way too casual. Um, and that's not a good look. Treat it like a job interview. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's once you're on placement. They won't do that if you no, go to an interview. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so just, just um, you know, dress professionally, present yourself professionally. And then also the important thing is this agency needs to get a sense of, are you going to fit into this team? Are you going to be um, someone who can work um, with the rest of the team in this agency? Um, so, you know, do you demonstrate, you know, basic interpersonal and communication skills? Do you demonstrate at least a basic enthusiasm for uh, the learning opportunities on placement? That doesn't mean that you have to be over the moon about uh, the field of practice that you've been matched to. But you're not going to say in an interview, I really didn't want to come here. I'm only here because the university um, matched me to this placement. Or 
the only job that I ever want to do in the future is domestic violence and I don't know why I've been sent to a school um, placement, you know, things like that. And we do get students saying things like that in interviews. Obviously not a good look. Um, so if you're really wanting to focus on what it is in this particular agency um, that gives you learning opportunities um, and, and really stay focused on that rather than talking about you know, more broadly, your career goals. Because that, in a sense, that's not really the agency's business, what you want to be doing in 10 years' time. What they want to know is, are you going to fit into the team? Are you going to not be a risk to their clients? So they're also looking for red flags. So things like over-disclosing or being hostile or being rude or being disrespectful or using inappropriate language. It's those kinds of things that would... Um, you know, would create red flags um, for people in the placement interview. But having said that, we've seen so many examples over the years of students being turned down um, at a placement interview for no good reason. Um, so if that happens to you, also, you know, remember that we're here to talk through um, that and also to then make sure that you're better prepared for the next um, placement interview. And the reason they turned you down may have nothing to do with anything that you did wrong. Um, so that's important to know as well. I did a mid-placement meeting for a final placement student on Tuesday and the feedback from the um, supervisors on the placement was in the interview she really conveyed a sense of her values. Mm. Um, and it wasn't necessarily like, you know, she was shouting them from the rooftop, but just in the language that she used, the open-mindedness she displayed, those sorts of things. And that, you know, they said, we don't normally have bachelor's students, but that's what got her over the line. Well, you know, then we felt this is a really good fit for, for her to come. So I think, you know, if you want to go into the human services, be thinking about your values and how you convey that yeah. and the way you present the language that you use, those sorts of things. And also you might want to think about, um, you know, they might have asked you a question about what you need in terms of your learning. What's going to help you and the best fit for you around uh, how you learn best. So you might want to do mm -hmm. some thinking and be clear about that as well. All right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You can keep oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, the hours that we do quite a bit of hours, that incorporates the uh, first degree into the first semester of next year, right? Yes. Yes. So there's no yeah. expectation to go home and <laughs> no. do it as sort of half the hours. Yeah. That's a great question. So if you can't hear on the recording, Lucas is asking, uh, what counts um, as, as part of your placement hours, and absolutely, um, you shouldn't be doing work at home um, unless it's pre-arranged and it's counting towards your placement hours. So sometimes there are good reasons for doing work from home. Might be because you don't have adequate internet access and you're currently working on a particular report um, for the agency, and the agency has said that you can do that work from home might be because there's a temporary COVID-related shutdown. Um, but all of your assessments, um, your integration seminars, your placement lectures, also all of your classes count as part of your placement hours. Um, so we don't schedule more hours of classes than you're allowed to count um, as part of your hours and the assessments. So um, we generally say that students should be allowed to do about an hour of reflective and written work per day on placement. Um, you can sometimes negotiate something differently, but that's usually how people spend their time um, doing preparation for written assessments, um, evidence for your mid and end of placement assessments, um, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Sorry, I was just gonna say, Richard, before you start, I think it's really important that what you don't do, and this is where agencies get a bit um, narky about it, yeah. is if students are giving the impression that they're spending all day at the computer doing uni work yeah. for mid-placement or those sorts of things, that's not a good look. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're actually turning, you're probably turning down learning opportunities mm -hmm. to be doing practice yeah. in order to do that. And, you know, that's not received yeah. very well at all. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a combination. So always in consultation with your field education liaison person. Yeah. yeah. 
Yes. 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 It depends on the situation. Um, so, you know, there are all, all kinds of ways that conflict might arise, but either between students or between a student and particular staff members or vol volunteers in an agency. Um, we, the field education liaison person in those cases would always need to be part of that conversation, trying to resolve the issues. Um, there might be complex issues involved. So, for example, if one student has bullied another student, that has to be taken very seriously and we have a duty of care to the student who has um, felt, um, you know, bullied or, um, or harassed in some way. You know, we have, unfortunately, it's unusual, it's rare, but we have had situations over the years where um, students have got into difficulty because of um, complaints that have been made about their behaviour towards other students. But like I say, it's rare um, for that to happen. Um, but if you do get into a conflict, um, it is important to speak with your field education liaison person. But it's also important to remember that one of the things that you're being assessed on is your communication and interpersonal skills. Um, so you need to also be able to demonstrate that you can, you have strategies for avoiding conflict in the first place. And it's very tricky because it's, it's hard to avoid sometimes getting into challenging conversations with people. Um, you know, if you're trying to advocate for a client in a situation where you feel that they've been treated unfairly, that can be a very difficult conversation to have. Um, and the agency might feel that you've been inappropriate, whereas you're actually doing the right thing by advocating for them from an ethical um, perspective. Um, but the important thing is, you know, looking at how um, you, do, you do that communication and also understanding that you there in the role of a learner um, and understanding the boundaries of that. So not telling agency staff how to do their jobs, um, even if you see things that you clearly know are, are not appropriate. Um, and also knowing, you know, that you need to have a respectful relationship with your supervisor and with other um, agency staff members and volunteers. And of course, most importantly, clients. We have unfortunately also had situations where students have got into conflict with clients and that's m taken much, much more seriously. Because you can't, you just can't, you, you know, <laughs> you can't go there. If, if, if you have a difficult situation involving a client, you need to be able to demonstrate that you can manage that using professional um, communication skills, not getting into a, an argument. Um, but again, <laughs> I That's think also so if rare. you are feeling like, you know, maybe there's a bit of a, it's not quite gelling with your supervisor and things like that, that's a really good uh, conversation for you with your field education yeah. liaison. Because while we might not go and have the conversations for you, we can certainly talk you through mm -hmm. how might you go about resolving this, yeah. how might you have a different conversation with your supervisor and those sorts of things to try and avoid it from escalating or ending yeah. up where it's um, really, you, you're in a difficult spot. Yep. Anything else? Just to add to that, uh, just to share a personal experience, I have had in my come to the microphone. <laughs> we'll try not to. In the, in the first placement, I had a bad experience in the first half. It was cancelled, uh, and the university had to cancel it. Janine was there, and she was, oh, she was very supportive. So just to let you know, if, if you're having trouble, Trust the university. Speak to your FPL, speak to the university. They're very understanding. They pulled us out of the situation. And in two weeks, we were matched to another, uni uh, another agency, which we did not expect. And that went beautifully. So we did finish our placement by first week of December as planned. And it was, it was great. So just trust the university, but do not get involved with the agency, because that is what we did not do. Do not get into arguments. Just step back and speak to the FEL or the university, that will help. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really good point as well, because sometimes things do happen that are inappropriate, so you might be treated in a way that's inappropriate, um, and 
there have been situations where we've actually pulled students out of placement because they've been treated unfairly or inappropriately or they've been um, the subject of harassment or even you know, bullying on occasion. So always um, in situations like that, if you're feeling uncomfortable or having difficulties, the, your, your first point of contact is your field education liaison person. That's what we're there for. Um, if we can't resolve it with your field education liaison person, the next step is with the topic coordinator. Um, and we, we really do follow a fair process um, where we really try to listen to all the different perspectives of people in those more challenging situations. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Have you had a no. So the question is, do you need to be able to drive for placement? No. So there are some agencies that require either that you drive an agency car or that you have your own car um, to be able to go to um, you know, different agencies, maybe different sites of the same agency, um, but they also are agencies where you don't require driver's license um, at all. And Annalise and Kim take that into account when they do the placement matching. So as long as you've entered your information on in place correctly, um, then they take that into account in the placement matching. So they won't match you to a placement that requires that you drive an agency car if you um, don't have a driver's license. Okay. Yeah. Is, there, is the question about the Australian license? I, don't, I haven't seen in-place questions yeah, recently. Yeah. Yeah, so on in place it does ask what type of licence and usually it is an Australian licence that is required um, and then again some agencies will also specify if you need your own vehicle or if they have an agency vehicle so some mm -hmm. won't ever need you to use your own um, while some may have both yep. or either yep. but usually um, it's always an Australian licence that they ask for. And that's only if you're going to have to drive an agency car. It's none of their business what kind of license you have if you're driving your own car. Mm. <laughs> but if, if you need to drive an agency car for insurance purposes, it has to be an Australian um, driver's license. Yeah, I have yeah. a car. I have a real driver's license. But if my car, my thing, I buy a license, I think I... You mean you're on your P still? So you drive a license. Oh, motorbike, motorbike license. Yeah. But if you don't have an Australian driver's license for a car, then your answer to that question is no. Yeah. 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 Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, do, I haven't seen the question, so I don't. <laughs> um, I would probably put in the additional information section, so like a little bit further down, um, if you specify then what kind of licence, because we always take into account anything else that you put in there. If you need to explain something, so you could put in there what type of licence you're referring to, and then we can keep an eye on that, so then when it comes to matching you, you will know um, what that means. Uh, anything else? Seems like we're done. Yeah? So can I leave you with a few, and Kirsty, I don't know if you want to add anything, and Annalise and Richa and Lucas, um, maybe just kind of rounding up with a few positive messages. Um, field placement does is often a major source of anxiety for students. Understandably, we understand. We did field placements a very long time ago, <laughs> very long time ago, but we still remember some of the um, some of the anxiety and, and stress that goes with that. In fact, one day when we've got time, I'll tell you a couple of stories about my one of my placement experiences. But anyway, um, 
most importantly to remember the vast majority, the vast majority of students have a successful uh, first placement and final placement experience. The vast majority of students tell us that they have valuable learning experiences on placement. There are occasionally things that go wrong with placements, but those are in the minority. Um, and again, we have a support system and we have policies and processes in place um, to support you. It's our job um, to, to support you in the, as best we can if you're struggling in any way. Um, and if someone ends up failing a placement, you have to know that there's been a long involved process to get there and every stone has been unturned in the process. Um, so we really do have to follow a fair process um, when someone is struggling um, with their placement. But that's really not the, um, the, the majority of people's experience. People often come back and tell us that this has been where the learnings come alive um, for them when they go into a real human services agency. Um, it's overwhelming and it's daunting, but it's also really exciting to be out there and having an opportunity to see practice um, and start um, developing those, um, honing your practice skills um, in a real human services setting. So we are confident that um, for almost everyone, your placement experience will be um, a good one. Um, and we wish you the best of luck with your placements in second semester. So I won't be part of placements anymore um, next semester. I'm doing other things, um, but I still have a very strong um, love for field education um, and we'll be hearing <laughs> from our colleagues in the corridor about... <laughs> um, so yeah, see you around um, and come and tell us how you're going with your placements and um, good luck. Is there anything that you want to... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you I assume everyone has their name and fan in this as this is a piece of paper. Anyone that hasn't? Are you sure? This is like a huge responsibility. Are you just waiting for one of you? Oh. I think you really should do it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You don't need to do that. <laughs>
Hi, Mr. Ken. Can you have a little time? Is, is this scholarship applied by? Yeah, maybe I can relocate. You know. Oh, yeah? yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. Because uh, I can work. job opportunities in yeah. your areas. Yes. Yeah. But I, you know, failed my information as I didn't want to go, you know, I didn't want to travel and then 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to travel uh, more than 40 minutes in the, like, in the, you know, in placement, yeah. the system. So I need to change them now. Or, or if you're interested in the removal place, yeah. then let um, Annalise and Kim know. Kim? Uh, Annalise and Kim are their from Annalise and Kim are their from Annalise and Kim. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and it's okay. It's kind of cool to have music <laughs> as well.